Welcome and thanks for joining with us here at uh, St Andrew's Church of Scotland, Brussels for our online service today, the 8th of January 2023. This is the first Sunday in Epiphany. Uh, Epiphany means something like appearance or manifestation. And at this time, we're a time of year, we remember both the appearance of the Magi when Jesus appeared to them, when Jesus was manifested to them as the Messiah, and also Jesus's baptism, which of course was when he was an adult, um, when it became clear that he was indeed the Son of God. Our readings take those themes then, and the title, Here is My Servant, uh, is also the, the big theme, if you like, for the, for the whole service. And in our picture story, we'll be looking at those three magi, the three kings we sometimes call them, the three wise men um, who visited Jesus, and, uh, and what happened uh, after that, uh, which was so dramatic and so uh, important in the life of Mary and Joseph and their little baby. Well, let's begin with uh, worship in our song, Love Divine. And we bring it from our friends in Rotterdam. Uh, and this focuses our attention on the love that the Lord brings to us in Jesus and the love that he seeks to fill our hearts with. Love divine, all loves excelling. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they 
with me. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you reign over us all. You are a strong tower. You are our ever-present hope in times of trouble. As we chart our way forward in 2023, we invite you into our most private spaces, into our hearts, our minds, and our lives. We pray that our spirits will be renewed with your grace, which is new every morning. Great is your faithfulness in all seasons. We confess, Lord, that we have fallen short of who you've called us to be. We have leaned on our own understanding. We have been impatient, not fully trusting that you will always make a way. Sustaining God, as in Christ, you enter with mercy, energy, compassion, and love into the life of the earth. Call us to account. Show us the power we have in you and how we should use it for your glory. In this still very young year, we bring our burdens and place them at the foot of the cross and ask for your forgiveness. You are doing a new thing in our lives and for this we are eternally grateful. May our praise join in the chorus of all that has breath as we pray together the way that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, King Herod was the king of the Jewish people. And he made sure that nobody else could be king. He didn't want anybody else to have power where he had power. And the Bible tells us that when Herod learnt that God had sent a new king on earth, he was very jealous. And wise men, magi we sometimes call them, sometimes we call them kings actually, came from the east to King Herod's palace in Jerusalem. They'd been following the stars and this there was a bright new star in the sky in the eastern sky and they'd been following it and they came all the way to jerusalem looking for this newborn king now king herod and the people of jerusalem were worried the king called for the chief priests and the teachers who'd been studying the writings of the old prophets and he asked them where the Christ should be born. In Bethlehem, they replied, which was just a few kilometers from Jerusalem. So Herod asked the wise men when they came to him, when they had first seen the star and sent them to Bethlehem then to find this young king. And when you find him, said King Herod, and he did this very slyly, and that means underhand or behind their backs, devious. He was being, he was trying to trick them actually, because, well, we'll see. When you find him, come and tell me so that I too can go and worship him too. He didn't mean that, of course. He had something else in mind. Well, the wise men saw the star over Bethlehem, over the house there where Mary and the little child were, baby Jesus. And they went inside to give their gifts. And an angel told them in a dream not to go back to King Herod, because King Herod didn't want to worship Jesus. He wanted to kill him. So the wise men waited. So King Herod rather waited for the wise men to come back and tell him where the newborn king 
God's promised one was. So he could send his soldiers to get rid of him. Herod didn't want anybody else to threaten him to be in power. King Herod worked out from the time that the wise men first saw the star that the child would still be under two years old. So he ordered his soldiers to Bethlehem to get rid of every child, every boy child, under the age of two, which was a very, very awful thing to do. But God warned Joseph that King Herod's soldiers were coming. And quickly, the family hurried away to Egypt before the soldiers arrived. And the family lived there safely in Egypt until King Herod died. The first reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 to 9. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says. The creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth and with all that springs from it. Who gives breath to people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. To open the eyes of the, that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who will sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare before they spring into being. I announce them to you. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is taken from Matthew chapter 3 verses 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, and with whom I am well pleased. Here ends the second reading. One of the less publicised facts about the war in Ukraine is that tens of thousands of Ukrainians, adults and children, have gone from Ukraine to various parts of Russia. It's hard to work out from the propaganda. Uh, Russian media speak about hundreds of thousands of what they call refugees seeking relief and help in Russia, while Ukraine speaks or claims that these people have been forcibly deported, have been taken as exiles into Russia. And not just into Russia, but into the far east of Russia, way towards Siberia. One day, I hope, we pray, that we'll find out the truth behind, uh, behind this. Well, that scenario, 
tens, indeed hundreds of thousands of people moved from one land to another, is what lies behind our reading from Isaiah. Around 600 years before Jesus Christ was born on earth, hundreds of thousands of men, women and children, maybe we should say tens of thousands, we don't know exactly the number, were taken from uh, Jerusalem and Judea against their will, they really, really didn't want to go, over to the area, that's to say they went east, um, over to the area that we nowadays call Iraq, and which was then called Babylon. The Jews in the north, the land that was called then Israel, had been taken captive a hundred and more years before by the Assyrians who were from the northern part of what we nowadays call Iraq. Now the people from Judea were not slaves in, um, in Babylon. They, we believe, lived in a, a ghetto, a kind of ghetto, and they were free if they wanted to, to practice they, their religion, if they wanted to, and they had jobs, uh, we know that. And some of them actually did very well in the thriving commercial world of Babylon. Because Babylon was a very thriving culture at that time. We also understand that some of them were teased and, well, we might say persecuted by the locals. Hence the famous Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There our captors, our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And they were there for the best part of 60 years. So bearing in mind that a minority, probably a small minority of people ever reached the age of 60 at that time. By the time Isaiah came with his prophecy that we read from Isaiah 42, by the time Isaiah came with his prophecy, hardly anyone hearing it, reading it, would ever have seen their homeland, Judea, Jerusalem. Records suggest that a good number, we don't know, how many abandoned their Jewish faith, we can understand why. With each passing year, it had become more and more obvious, to some of them anyway, that the Lord Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of Judah, had been defeated. And he wasn't going to rescue them in exile. It's difficult for us to imagine, I guess, but they and their parents, their grandparents, identified their land so closely with their God, it was the land God had given to them after all, that without the land, they were without God. And the Babylonians had their own ancient culture and religion. In the spring, for instance, they brought down the statue of Marduk, Marduk, their city god, as it were, and paraded it around the streets. And there were wild celebrations. It was fun. Maybe some of the Jews found that a more attractive ritual and religion to practice than Jewish faith. You know how it goes. When people around you are having fun and doing their thing, it's hard not to be assimilated, to go with the flow. And their Jewish faith, based in a faraway temple, which in any case had been demolished, probably seemed dead of the past to be forgotten. So it's probable that a good number abandoned their faith. And then along came the prophet Isaiah, comfort, comfort my people, he said back in chapter 40, their service was ended. Now, to be honest, I don't know how many of them believed him at that point. The facts as they saw them seemed to be totally against it. They were dispirited, they were leaderless, they were landless. I suspect many of them saw Isaiah as nothing more than a dreamer. Yeah, it would be wonderful if God had come to their rescue, but... But then something extraordinary happened. The king of Persia, the country we nowadays call Iran, 
simply walked into Babylon, turfed King Nabodidus off his throne and took over. No war, no battles were fought. The Persian king, who was called Cyrus, simply waltzed in. And to add to this amazement, he announced that all the exiles could go home. The icing on the cake was that the Persians would actually help them to leave. It was a long way, it was a dangerous journey across the desert, but Cyrus would help them. Cyrus, I guess, wanted these educated and able people out of Babylon, and away in Judah, they would be less of a threat to him. Isaiah saw the miraculous hand of God in all this, and he named King Cyrus Messiah, the Anointed One. You can see that in the first verse of chapter 45 of Isaiah. King Cyrus was no believer. He was a pagan, as we would call him, as the Jews would call him. But with that decision to let the Jews return to Judah, the world turned upside down for them. The tales they had heard of their homeland suddenly became a possible future for them. Small wonder that the Jews saw Cyrus as a hero, indeed as a saviour. So when Isaiah wrote the first verse of our reading today, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Some people might, to begin with anyway, have thought, Ah, he's speaking about Cyrus. Cyrus is God's servant, surely. He's bringing us justice. But if you read this prophecy further, you realise that that can't be so. This is no conquering hero king, but a quiet, gentle, almost invisible agent of the Lord. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In the two and a half thousand years since then, many, many people have disagreed about who this servant is, was, or was meant to be, or indeed maybe will be. Those words about bringing justice to the nations were, after all, far from new. Previous prophets like Amos, Micah, Hosea and others had all said something similar, that the Lord expected Israel in the north, Judah in the south, to seek justice for all people, to be a light to the Gentiles, that's to say the unbelievers, the people who were not Jews, to be an example to others. What's new then? here is the way this servant will go about his work. Not crying out, verse 2, or even breaking a bruised reed. This is no Cyrus. This is not him leading his armies through the streets of Babylon with his slaves and spear carriers and chariot drivers and who knows what. So who was this servant who would work in such a quiet way? What was his focus, his purpose? And does it mean anything to us today? Well, the answer to that question is a lot easier than who it was. His purpose would be to bring justice. The Hebrew word for justice is very famous, even I know it, mishpat. It has little to do with courts and law, courts of law and so on and judges. Rather, justice is what Andrew Bartelt calls a peaceful and whole life relationship with God with others and with all creation. That was God's purpose for the people, Israel, to bring mishpat, justice, and also shalom, peace, to the nations of the world. You see that right at the start of his dealings with Abram, back in Genesis uh, chapter 12, and repeatedly again thereafter, that was his purpose for his people, Israel. So to get back to that question as to who this servant is, if that was God's purpose, justice and peace, 
To get well to, back to the question of who it may well be, well, perhaps the servant was Israel. Israel perhaps would be the one to bring justice in these quiet and gentle ways. That would be to state again the mission and purpose that Israel had long had of bringing justice and peace. What's striking is how the servant would do it, quietly and almost unseen. It's Amy Oden who puts it quite colourfully. There's no talk of revenge, of turning the tables on the Babylonians. No, let's kick butt and take names. And perhaps that's the point. Perhaps that's the point to turn Israel away from the temptation to build an army and to fight back against the Babylonians and to punish them for what they had done. That's not the Lord's will. Perhaps that's what he's saying. The people hadn't lived in their homeland for 60 years and there would doubtless have been many angry, hurting people, especially when they got back and saw the mess that Jerusalem was in, that Judah was in, houses destroyed, streets torn up, fields lying waste. But maybe this is the Lord saying through Isaiah, no violence, no revenge, please, in faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. Obedience to God is the way to bring justice, not fighting and killing. Now, in Isaiah, there are in fact four passages like this one we have today, where the prophet writes about the servant. We call them the servant songs, and ours is the first. And in the second one, which you'll find in chapter 49, verses 4 to 9, we're told who the servant is. You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendour. So I agree with the writer Tyler Mayfield when, who writes that these words of Isaiah's are part of a prophetic announcement about their near future. The task of the people that they, uh, the task of the people now have before them, now that they've returned to exile, is this: to be a covenant for the people, a light for the Gentiles, to open the eyes of the blind, or seven to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Previous prophets had warned them that failing to have these goals and priorities of justice and peace and so on would lead to disaster. It did, and now Isaiah is bringing them back to that same purpose. By way of confirmation of what we, of this, we get that verse nine, see the former things have taken place. God had promised that the people would be exiled to teach them a lesson. It's as if he's saying, I told you I would do it. I did, but now I'm doing a new thing. However, <laughs> 600 years later, those who recognised Jesus as the Messiah quickly applied these servant songs to him. He would quietly and non-violently bring about justice. He would open the eyes of the blind and free captives from prison. Matthew says so in chapter 12 of his gospel and Mark chapter 4 tells us that the the very first message that Jesus brought was from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, proclaim freedom to prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. All sounds very much like chapter 42, doesn't it? To set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And then Mark tells us Jesus rolled up that scroll, gave it back to the attendant and said, chapter 4, Verse 21 of Mark, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus seemed to fit the bill for this servant. But finally, these words of Isaiah's are also about and for us, for you and me. They were about the exiles, yes, returned from Babylon back 600 years before Jesus. They were about Jesus and his ministry, absolutely. He seems very clearly to say so. But they're also about us. So along with that same Tyler Mayfield, I would ask, how might we, 
as God's people today, be servants of God in whom God delights. How do we go about that, establishing justice on earth as it is in heaven? How do we take up the mission of the servant and live out our baptismal vows? And also as churches, not just as individuals, how as churches can we be God's servants to the world? We participate in God's new thing, God's new exodus, as it were, out of exile, out of brokenness. And God's community, the church, Tyler Mayfield writes, is God's servant now. The Hebrew word I mentioned a few minutes ago, mishpat, justice, is what it's all about. Christians are surely all called to work, to bring about justice and to support those who are victims of injustice. It's not enough for us just to enjoy our own personal, private relationship with God and our lovely fellowship here at St Andrews, which is so warm, so welcoming, accepting. Our calling is also to be servants who tirelessly, but quietly and certainly non-violently seek justice. And that's about the way we live. It's about the foods we eat. It's about how we spend our money, the clothes we wear, and surely caring for the environment because it's totally unjust that the poorest people in the world should suffer most from the effects of climate change. So as we close, I would invite you to hear this verse from our reading as if it were spoken directly to you personally and also to us as a fellowship, as a church. Hear the words then. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. Amen. And may the Holy Spirit empower you, me, us. For that task. We now make our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Dear Father God, we thank you for this past year with its positive moments and its more difficult ones. We thank you for the love we have received from family and friends and for the successes that we have had at work and at home. We thank you that you have been by our side during the hard moments too. The moments that we struggled with, the moments of challenge, the moments of uncertainty, the moments where we have been afraid for our safety and for those we love, the moments when we lost those dear to us. A new year has dawned, but the war in Ukraine still rages on. Thousands of Ukrainian refugees and victims of this terrible conflict are suffering as they scrape a living among cities deprived of water, electricity and heat in the depths of winter. We pray that you bring reason and a desire for peace to the people responsible for this conflict, Lord, so that the war can stop. Gracious God, we continue to pray for the people of Iran who are oppressed under a regime that rejects your light. May you embolden your church 
to speak out against such injustices. Similarly, we pray for Christians who are suffering prosecution from governments that are hostile to Jesus and the very thought of a servant king. We ask you to embolden Christians everywhere, Lord, in the face of these many threats to be fearless witness of truth, justice and Christian love, we pray. Creator Lord, help us to recognize and acknowledge our damaging impact on your creation, both individually and as a society. Guide us in our way of living on this earth that you created and prompt us to embrace change where necessary for the good of future generations and all of your creatures. We also pray for the many people, both here in Brussels and elsewhere, who are struggling to make ends meet as the cost of living continues to rise. Generous Lord, please provide for their needs and give them hope for this winter. Above all, we pray for people who have lost their way in life distracted by the superficial pressures and temptations of our modern world. We pray that you open their hearts so that they turn from their futile pursuits and recognize your presence and offer of salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son. May they be pulled into your loving embrace of eternal life with you. Dispel the darkness and the suffering and let your light shine through in these dark days. Heavenly Father, hear us, we pray, as we take a moment or two in silence to bring our own particular situation before you. Lord, help us in this new year to walk beside each other with patience and forgiveness putting our hands in the hands of your son, Jesus. He guides us, he strengthens us, he is always by our side, he gives us hope, he helps us beyond the small now to the bigger picture and the wider plan, the plan that you imagine for us, you, our Father. In your mercy, hear our prayer, in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Our Christmas, our Christmas givings have gone to the London-based charity Borderline, which offers support and practical help to homeless Scots in London. Many thanks to those of you who donated in church and online. 1,500 euros has been sent to Borderline, so thank you. And I'd like to offer a big thank you to the people who put these online services together. Um, I'm sure you know, that, whether you're computer literate or absolutely not, I'm sure you know that this is a skilled job uh, requiring computer software and mastery of that. And week by week, John MacDonald spends hours doing this editing for us so that we can worship online in such a meaningful way and keep contact with those of you who can't uh, come to the church in person. So many thanks, uh, John, many thanks. And recently, Alain Muhire has joined the team. And when John's been away, as he has been over the past uh, week or two, he's edited one or two of the services, including, in fact, this one. So a very big thank you also to him, Murakose Alain. Our thanks are also due to the small army of people, um, perhaps including some of you, um, who contribute prayers and readings so that we share together in worship. If you'd like to participate, please let me know. All we really ask is that you speak clearly and understandably. Uh, making a recording at home is very easy on most mobile phones. That's how most of us do it, myself uh, included. Now, our burn supper is fast approaching and there will be just one more online service before it takes place in the church hall on Saturday, the 21st of January. If you're able to help or if you'd like to come, then please let me know as soon as possible. Uh, or indeed David Lloyd, who's uh, doing a lot of the organising. Tickets cost €35, Euros, most of that, as usual, going to charity. I'm very grateful to those of you who let me know when members of our church fellowship are unwell or would benefit from a phone call or indeed a visit from myself. Please bear that in mind. Let me know if there's somebody you know or know of who would benefit from a pastoral call. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord said to us, I have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. So may the Lord God help you to hear that call and put your hand in his and empower you by his Holy Spirit to be a light and to be love to those who do not yet know him. And may grace, mercy, and peace be yours today, this year, and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.